Uh, my topic will here will be uh, magisterial Baptist political theology. Uh, and if you're wondering what in the world is that, as many do, um, essentially, um, this, is, this is a term I made up a few years ago. And uh, so I'm going to, this is the first chance I have to, to kind of unpack what I've meant by it. Um, but, but put simply, uh, what I want to commend is essentially classical Protestant political philosophy as represented by guys like Richard Hooker, John Calvin, Althusius, Franciscus Junius, et cetera, as compatible with a belief in credo baptism. So put another way, uh, I wanna just argue that while the differences between Baptists and Presbyterians or Anglicans or the Dutch Reformed or whoever really do matter, um, we are all species or variations of Protestantism and that therefore we should not set forth Baptist political thought as a kind of different genus or, or totally different category of political thought alongside say Roman Catholics and reformed. We're not a third way. I want to argue we can, we're a species of, of Protestantism and ought to remain so. In my view, classical Pro Protestantism has a consistent set of universal and biblical principles that allow for flexibility and wisdom in prudential application in a variety of circumstances. So it's that combination of universal coherent principles um, with differing applications in different contexts that I think is, is one of the benefits of the of classical Protestant thought on this. So let me just offer a few key elements of, of that thought that I think are, are true and relevant for this discussion. Here's some basic distinctions uh, that are core to the Protestant vision. Um, number one is just the distinction between the soul and the body or the inner man and the outer man. And sort of correlated to that distinction is the distinction between belief, which is in the inner man or the soul, and practice in the outer man or the body. So that's a really important distinction. I suspect maybe when the, in the discussion we'll double click on that one. Um, alongside that, you have the distinction between heavenly life and earthly life, or sometimes stated as the spiritual versus the temporal. Uh, this is the basic sort of two kingdoms distinction. If you've heard of two kingdoms theology, this is the basic idea with the earthly kingdom or the temporal kingdom, including the family, the visible church, civil society, and the state. All of those are on the earthly kingdom side and the heavenly or spiritual kingdom uh, being the soul's relation to God directly. Uh, third, uh, along those lines, you heard it there with the language of visible church is a distinction in the church between the invisible church and the visible church, the invisible church known only to God, represented the elect um, who uh, have believed and trusted in their hearts in Christ, and then the visible church, which would include both the universal visible church, sort of all saints throughout the world, uh, visible saints throughout the world, and then the local visible churches, actual congregations uh, of Christians gathered together um, in particular places. So that's a key distinction, is that invisible, visible distinction in, in Protestantism. Um, a, a fourth one would be the, the distinction between a universal principle and its contingent application. So um, we have principles and we have applications, and we, we have to apply those universal principles in uh, concrete circumstances using prudence. And so prudence is a really major category in my own thinking, derived from, from Protestant thought, about the, the relative wisdom of bringing this principle to bear how exactly in a particular place. Uh, fifth uh, kind of key distinction is the distinction between law and punishment. I think this is where a, a kind of a, a confusion can sometimes come into play on these issues. Laws, at their most basic, both instruct people in what is good or and evil, and they obligate obedience. So that's the law portion. But the mechanism for compelling obedience always has a prudential or circumstantial element to it. So you can insist that this is the law, and yet you could have the punishment for a violation of that law vary in different circumstances for a variety of reasons. And so when it comes to the questions of coercion and things like that, I think that's a, a key issue we'll have to get into. Uh, and then um, finally, the, the Protestant sort of divisions of law, um, I'm using my own terms for them. Well, some of these are, are, are you'll find other people, but um, distinctions like natural law versus positive law, uh, both of those versus sort of what we might call redemptive law or the law of grace, sort of the gospel, the special uh, re revealed um, thing. Those sort of distinctions, I think, are really helpful and valuable. Uh, natural law, which includes the moral aspect of both tables of the Ten Commandments. So that's the natural law. It's baked into the cake. It's what God established in creation and then is publicized and expressed in the Mosaic Code. 
but is in some ways is universal. And that's accessible to all, obligatory and all through general revelation. Um, that law is then applied via positive law in those concrete circumstances. So now we're back to that prudential application piece. Uh, redemptive law is the specially revealed, um, uh, as I say law, uh, obligation to, uh, that pertains to the means for obtaining eternal life. So in, in the new covenant era, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. So pulling all of those together, um, all institutions in the earthly kingdom, whether the family, the visible church, civil society, or the state, are ordained and established by God as his ministers for our good. And this is important, they can know that. They can know what they are and what they're for, and they ought to acknowledge that. They ought to say so. Um, they ought to be able to say, we know what we are, we know what we're for, we know um, how we fit. Each of them, in their various ways, ought to direct and order human beings toward the eternal and heavenly good. So all of them have a role to play in ordering human beings to the eternal and heavenly good using the various means, modes, and powers that God has established for them, whether the rod or the sword or um, the keys, whatever, whatever you have. Uh, while they cannot themselves accomplish eternal life for individuals, again, we're talking family, visible church, society, state, they can't accomplish eternal life for individuals because that's a work of grace. All of them all of these institutions can and ought to foster cultural conditions conducive to conversions or what we can affectionately call C4. So th this is what you're doing in your family when you're fostering the conditions that will conduce, Lord willing, to the conversion of your children. This includes promoting, praising, and rewarding what is good, both earthly and heavenly, as well as condemning, censuring, and punishing what is evil. And so with respect to the present question of religious liberty, at the level of principle, the state, like the family, I believe, is competent to apply both tables of the law at the level of behavior and practice, though not at the level of belief itself. You cannot actually co coerce belief, nor should you try. And they can use the appropriate means at their disposal to do so, so as to promote what is good and avoid social disorder and harm. Now, at the level, that's the principle level, okay? Now we've got to talk application level. There's latitude for a wide array of arrangements based on history, circumstances, demographics, and so forth, which leaves room for various kinds of toleration, dissent, enforcement, establishment, whether formal or informal establishment, a hard establishment or a soft establishment, all kinds of room for discussion and particulars there. But at the principal level, they're competent to apply both tables. And I believe the attempt to separate the first table from the second table of the law, meaning the love God side from the love your neighbor side, is incons inconsistent and untenable. The second table hangs on the first. I think this is maybe a place where Jonathan and I are getting a similar issue here. Um, human society, marriage, property, and a righteous legal system require a true and transcendent grounding in the worship of God. You don't get to keep the second without the first. And so this means that, again, in principle, so I'm talking principle, I'm not advocating for particular policies, I'm just we're, we're dealing principle, the public promotion and favoring of Christianity or the institution of blasphemy laws or Sabbath laws are all permissible and righteous while allowing for variation in the prudential applications in different circumstances, America versus other parts of the world, um, time period, all sorts of things like that. But in principle, those things are permissible and righteous. And so here's my claim. As a magisterial Baptist, my claim is that none of those classic Protestant political uh, philosophy positions are contradictory to the belief and practice that baptism is properly applied to those who make a profession of faith. And so my main burden for us as Baptists is that we avoid adopting fundamental theological and political principles that render every political arrangement prior to the 1970s to be fundamentally unjust and inhumane. Or we ought to avoid theological and political principles that would indict the Torah as contrary to human dignity and freedom. God's law as applied to Israel was good and righteous. And so we don't wanna have principles that would suggest otherwise. Uh, we ought to avoid theological and political principles that indict the ordering and conduct of our families as unjust and contrary to human dignity and freedom because we make our ch kids go to church. We, we, in, we, we make them, we, we make them do it. And so we're regulating their behavior, but not their belief. We can't coerce that. We can, 
but we can cultivate uh, cultural conditions conducive to conversion by regulating and ordering their behavior to eternal and heavenly good. And so we ought to avoid a theological and political principle or a commitment to a principled public agnosticism, which will inevitably, as we're seeing, devolve into a de facto public atheism and sexual anarchy. And so classical Protestantism has a consistent set of universal and I think biblical principles that allow for flexibility and wisdom in prudential application in a variety of circumstances. And so I just want to say to my fellow Baptists, uh, let's be Protestants. <laughs>